But anyway, what we were talking about with interference and diffraction is a quick, here's a quick reminder. We did Young's double slit. So Young's double slit, the characteristic thing you care about is the spacing between those two slits that we call D. And you care about the distance to the screen that we called L, right? And with Young's double slit, the interesting pattern you get is that cosine squared pattern, where these high peaks are interference maxima, and the low peaks are interference minima, right? So if you're curious, this means the intensity of the light. And you always get one maxima right in the middle, because that's where the two rays are going the same distance. And then you get another maxima up here, where the difference in the rays equals one wavelength, so they end up constructive. You could say, what's happening here? Ah, the difference in distance equals a half wavelength. So what we said is it makes a pattern, and we gave you the formula for the pattern. You can look it up. It's cosine squared, something or other. But we mostly care, most of the problems are about finding where on this y-axis do the peaks show up. Right? So there's always one at y equals zero. And then the first one showed up at lambda naught L over D. If we assume L is really big and D is really small and the angles are really small. And then the second one showed up at 2 lambda naught L over D. And this one you could call minus lambda naught L over D. If you're literally calculating positions on this axis, right? Minus 2 lambda naught L over D, etc. Okay? So there's your maxima. You can probably geometrically figure out where the minima are. Right? They're halfway between those for small angles. So this was one, this isn't really a diffraction, this was interference. We saw the pattern, we loved it, we were very excited. We also looked at diffraction. Kind of a similar problem, except now we just have one slit. Interesting. You can get interesting effects without even two slits. One slit with width A. And we only switch to A just to keep the two separate in our heads, right? We don't want to mix them up. So D was a separation of two slits, A is a width of one slit, but we also call L the distance to the screen, where we're asking ourselves, what is the pattern, right? And this pattern is interesting. Most of the light does what you'd expect. Most of the light goes straight forward, but it does make these waves, right? It doesn't make an image of the slit. It makes this sort of oscillating pattern like that, where right at the center was the sort of uh, communistic named uh, the central maximum right here. Most of the light is under the central maximum, okay? But then we can say, well, where this minimum? So it's not as easy to calculate as this, right? Here it was geometry. You set the difference equal to a certain number of wavelengths, and you're done. Here, this is diffraction. We're actually thinking of it as an infinite number of sources in the slit. It requires an integral, uh, an interval, no, an integral. I had it the first time. It requires you solve a diffraction integral to figure this pattern out. You can kind of get there by pulling some little tricks with A over 2, and you can calculate where this first minimum is. And you get that it's at L lambda over A. And then you can also show, we didn't do it, but you can say this one's at 2 L uh, lambda over A. And of course, therefore, this one is at minus L lambda over A and uh, minus 2 L lambda over A. So you can see very similar pattern, or you know, very similar expressions here. Right? It's the length, the wavelength over the characteristic uh, you know, size of the diffracting or interfering structure, okay? That's two things we did, okay? This pattern is called a sinc function, S-I-N-C. That stands for sine cardinal, right? Sinc of x is sine of x over x. So if you plot sine x over x and then square it, this pattern is actually sinc squared. It looks like that, okay? just FYI. Which brings me to my greatest physics joke ever. Two plane waves diffract into a bar and say, where should we sit? And the bartender says, sit by the sink. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That's the typical reception for that joke. Of course, that's just wave amplitude. You can also have two photons walk into a bar. That's intensity. Two photons diffract into a bar and say, where should we sit? And the bartender says, sit by the square sink. Ah, uh, yes, because most bars, you know, have the big square sink where you rinse the glassware, you know. Killing it. Killing it! Okay. So now the new thing that we didn't cover... I didn't even lift it. It's like automatic garage door. Now we're going to do grading, okay? And I want to cover this because this is like an application of these two things. 
So, you know, th this is the main two things in chapter 33 in addition to films. But let's also talk about a grading structure. A grading is many slits spaced at D. So in a way, it's somewhere in between Young's double slit and diffraction. The spacing is like, like Young's double slit. It's just we have a lot of them. But if we have a lot of them, we have to calculate it with an integral. Right? So we have to do a diffraction integral to figure out a diffraction grading. So that's why we're not going to do the math. We're just going to tell you what it does. You want to be very familiar with the behavior of a grading. And I'll give you the, you know, the answer and the formula that you need. So the grading, I would just cartoon draw like this. Right? It's a thin thing with a bunch of slits in it, okay? And you send some light at it, like that. So here's plane wave coming at it with some wavelength. We can keep putting the knots on there. There's no, we're not going into a dielectric, but we'll keep putting the knots on. And we just ask ourselves, same old question. We have a screen a distance L away. And what do we get, okay? So this is kind of like the central axis here that the light is along, all right, like that. So what are we gonna get? Well, both of these have a maximum right in the middle, right? So this probably has a maximum right in the middle. So yeah, it has a maximum right in the middle. But the maximum looks like this. Very sharp. Wow, very narrow. Okay, and then it's just nothing. Technically, there's little wiggles in here. If you look really close, nothing. Then boom, another one, very sharp, like that. And then nothing, 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 nothing. Oh my God, look at that, another one. Right? That's what the pattern would look like. And then down here, so this is zero. This is m equals 1, m equals 2, right, like that, right, minus 1, minus 2, etc. Like, so you got all your m equals 1s in there. And uh, so the maximum locations are the same as the double slit. As a double slit, it's that if you want to do it in terms of angle, d sine theta max, the, the angles where it's maximum, is equal to uh, m lambda, where m equals 1, or well, it can be 0, 1, 2. But then we make the approximation that we made over there, and sine theta just becomes y over l, and you bring it around. And this is also the same. The y max positions, also the same as over there, l, m, lambda over d. But the thing that's different, so the maximum locations are the same as the double slit, uh, but they're narrow. But the peaks, I guess I'll call it a peaks, are narrow. Right here, this was a sine squared function, or a cosine squared function. So the peaks are as wide as a half cycle. Here, they're super narrow peaks like this. And that is just the effect of adding up the sources, all the different diffraction sources. If we add them up, add them up, do the diffraction integral, it has the effect of making these peaks become sharp. So it's literally just this pattern if I just put you know, lines here instead of a smooth cosine square pattern. And that's the result. So y, and that's all we're going to do mathematically. Right? It's the same formula. Okay? So the reason we're, gonna, we're talking about it at all is because it's so important in you know technology and chemistry and biology and physics and well not math I mean nothing important there but you know all these other fields right so what we're going to do is show you light through a diffraction grating and you can easily get a diffraction grating they're not hard to acquire um, you just go it's just a laser beam so far don't get excited. Um, you just go and you get some of these funny uh, looking at the world and seeing like rainbows, glasses. You know, these are, these are supposed to be like Santa glasses you put on it. I don't know. I don't equate Santa with like seeing spectra of all the white light I see, but whatever. Okay, but here's one. Of the, so this is a grating. It's like a clear piece of glass with a bunch of slits in it. Well, it's plastic, obviously. It's cheap. With a bunch of slits that have the effect of doing that. Okay, so if I put the grating over uh, this laser, what we should see is a bunch of lasers. Except the center one probably will be bright and the other orders won't be as big. I didn't draw that part. So let me see if I can get this to come down. 
Oh, there you can see the shadow a little bit. Here it goes. Wow, nothing happened. Oh, that's just the shadow. Let me get it actually over the laser. Here we go. <laughs> wow, yes. That was almost disappointing. Oh, look at that. Ooh, it made four. Look, there's another one there. Okay, so I drew this, and it's doing that. So what's going on? So one thing is, uh, these are very fancy Santa glasses where they have a grating in two directions. Okay, so they have a gratings like, uh, you know, if we're looking down on it, they have gratings like this way and this way. So it's diffracting the light both ways. But we can also see that we get multiple ones, right? So here is m equals zero, and here is m equals one, and look, there is m equals two. I wonder if you can see m equals three. Oh, I'm excited. I don't know. Can we see m equals three? Uh, oh my God, there's m equals. Wait, no. Oh, I'm sorry, that was two. Sorry, everybody. Oh. I can see it. I can see it. If you come up later, you'll see it. Okay, so they're all there. Okay, so you can see them all. But the reason that's important is all I've done is, uh, well, it's kind of cool. You one laser beam, you get like five laser beams, so that's powerful. But now, if we put it over white light, so here we have a beam of white light, and you can see that where they show up depends on the wavelength, right? How high it goes, L M lambda over D. Sorry, Texas came out. A lambda. Sorry about that. I hide it as best I can, but I am from South Texas, or from Dallas. Ooh, look at that. So I'm showing you this to show you that uh, the first order, or so the diffraction, so the zero, what do you have here? It's still white. It didn't break into colors. Why? Because that's what we call the zeroth order signal. That's basically the light that went straight through. If you plug zero into here, what is the effect of lambda? Nothing. In zeroth order, all the light goes uh, to the same y, y equals zero. So all the colors are still overlapped. But if you go to m equals one, now suddenly the height y depends on the wavelength. Right? And that's why here we have what we call the first order spectrum. So blue is a shorter wavelength. It doesn't move as far and Y as green, longer wavelength, red, longer wavelength. Okay, so that's there, interesting. But then if it gets really dark, we can't get it dark enough, but you can probably see that M equals two. I can, I, I'm not joking, this I really can't see it. Right, the M equals two is roughly right here. You know, twice as far away, right? So there's another band of color there. That's the case now if you put a two here, L, M, Blue light is kind of a big Y, red is a bigger, bigger Y. So this is important because this is how we disperse light into colors. So what you do is if you have the light interact with matter and you look at the spectrum, you can figure out what's going on with the matter, right? This is how we discovered that the universe is expanding, how we can analyze gases and chemicals and blah, 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 blah. Right? All spectroscopy is based on having a grating separate out the light into colors. Okay. So if we had a big hydrogen cell here, you would see lines, dark lines missing because that light is being absorbed by the hydrogen and you're getting dark lines here. I think we're doing that at the end of the year. I think we put that lab in, even though according to Dr. Dodge, you don't learn anything, but it's pretty. I think that was his analysis of it. And I said, well, yeah, that's the one we want to do. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's the main reason I'm including that is because just you will know about gratings and spectroscopy and I want you to know what's happening in that little black box, black box instrument you're going to use someday, okay? Let me be a little bit rude about biologists and chemists for a minute, may I? Thank you. Oh, okay, never mind. It wasn't that funny anyway. No, no the biologists and chemists uh, use this instrument that disperses the light, and it's called a UV vis, right? And I have talked to some biologists and chemists, PhDs and MDs, mind you, that I'm pretty sure they think that it's called a UV vis. <laughs> I just put it in the UV vis. I'm like, but it's in the near IR. The interesting part we want is at 900 nanometers. So, well, yeah, the UV vis will measure that. I'm like, but you're calling it the UV vis. I'm like, yeah, the UV vis. And I realized, okay, they don't know that that means the ultraviolet invisible spectrometer. Okay, so a spectrometer that measures anything anywhere in the visible usually goes from, you know, 300 nanometers, which is in the UV, 400 to 700, which is in the visible. So our eye dies out here, but guess what still detects? Silicon. Silicon will go from like 700 to 1,000. Okay, so in spectroscopy, when you say the visible, you actually often mean out to a micron, even though that's technically what we would call the near infrared. Okay, or you just call everything the UV vis, and you don't even know what that means. 
it's a big box. It's called the UV Viz. I put it in, I get a spectrum, I show it to my boss, and that's, that's how it works. <laughs> yes. I heard somebody say it's true. Yes. <laughs> I could tell you stories that would horrify you. Okay. But then the doctors could show me things that would horrify me, so we all have to be good at something. Okay. Okay. So that's it for chapter 33. That's really all we're going to do. Because now we have to do more interesting, not interesting, uh, we have to do new things. Okay. So I guess I'll stop now and say, in addition to the homework being late, there's update on the pledge problem. Okay. The first pledge problem will be out by Monday, and you'll have a week to do it. So you're going to have next week, all next week, and next weekend. So remember the pledge problem, the only rule about it is you do it by yourself. Open notes, open book, not open entire internet, because I'm sure the problem's somewhere on the internet. But your own notes, the book, my videos, whatever you want to use, but you got to do it on your own. Right? So that means you have to do it fast. You have to do it closed book like a test. You just have to do it by yourself. Right? So that'll come out. Have it out Monday, it'll be due the next Monday. It'll be about diffraction. It'll be about everything up to right now. So it'll probably have like a uh, standing wave problem and then some sort of an interference problem, which is almost certainly going to be a thin film problem because we spend so much time on thin films because you love them so much. Okay. Now we're moving on to a whole different kind of optics here. Oh, no wonder I haven't gotten a text. Uh, 8061961. Now we're going to move on to ray optics. Okay. So ray optics is kind of like if we had a motivational speaker describe optics. So they don't really know anything about it, but says something very basic and somehow it works well. Okay. It looks something like this. It'd be like. Light. What is it? What is light? What is it? That's light. There you go. Some sort of Tony Robbins bullshit like that would be <laughs> the way that you would describe light. And somehow it helps people. So ray optics just means when light, light is a line. Use geometry. That's all it is. Okay, so there's not going to be a huge amount of physics in geometrical optics. There's a little bit of geometry. Okay, you don't have to do geometrical proofs, but it helps to be able to remember your, you know, similar triangles and your angle side angle and all that stuff. If I can remember that from 84, I think you guys can remember it from 2014 or whatever, whatever it is. Okay. Now, why would we do all this difficult stuff if we can just say it's a line? Why? Because so it's useful for objects uh, much uh, larger than the wavelength. I'll say much larger. OK? So if you're sort of in the classical macroscopic limit, you can pretend that light is just a line. No phase, no amplitude. What am I going to do amplitude? No phase, no wave. It's just a line. Or in the real world, since the wavelength of light is just a little bit less than a micron, you need to go about 100 times bigger than that. So I would say bigger than about 0 0.1 millimeters. If I get things on the 0 0.1, 100 micron scale and less and start shining lasers on them, you'll start to see wiggles on the edges, right? And that's diffraction. So you can get away with it as long as things are big, OK? So that's what we're doing now. No more phase. No more amplitude, just geometrical optics. Okay. okay, this, that wants to be there. Okay, so we'll just go with that. Okay, here we go. So now, we got to ask the question, where does light come from? All right, so now we got to think, to help you understand and, and get through geometrical optics, it helps to really think a little bit about what you're really seeing when you see things. Like, what, what, are you, what are you looking at? Okay? So when we're thinking about where do the rays come from, where does light come from, there's sort of two kinds of places it comes from. One is from, like, an actual source of light. So what is a real source of light? One is a light bulb, stupid. Yes, I know. A light bulb, a laser, 
and the sun and the stars. Any other sources of light? Your screens. I think that is literally it. Buttons, right? Buttons on devices have little LEDs in them. Is there anything else? Fireflies, bioluminescent light. Magma, piping hot magma. Um, that's all I've got. Lightning, oh, I'm so sorry. Duh, <laughs> lightning. Uh, extra credit, you may even think of more sources of light. I'm just kidding, not really, okay. So those are actual pieces of light. light. Light comes out, but can you always see them? No. The most, one of the most disappointing moments in my life, and that's saying a lot, is the first time I saw a laser, okay? I grew up in the 70s, Star Wars, very excited about lasers, and in the early 80s, this one kid, I don't know what his dad did, but he had a laser that he brought to school, and he plugged it in, and we're all excited, and he turns it on, and then, boop, a little, little red thing shows up, and I was like, well, I went home, you know, it was very just sad, right? So the laser was going like that. The laser actually is like the perfect uh, example of a ray. A ray is a line, a laser makes light go in a perfect line. So it's a pretty good example, but my eye, thank God, was here. Right? So you only see light if it goes into your eye. Right? So a laser shooting across the room you don't see. The only way to see a laser is to spray, you know, spray like uh, stuff in it so you can actually see it. Right? So here the laser's on, you don't even notice. There it is, right? So here we go. But you can see it if I spray something in it. Oh, there's the laser. Ooh. I think it's just water, don't worry. I don't actually. It's like theater smoke or something. Right? So you're seeing it then. If you put enough particles in the air, then the objects scatter light into your eye. Then you can see the laser. Right? So then my second laser I ever saw was at like the Children's Museum, and they had them in water with a little bit of uh, milk in it. And then you could actually see it in the water. Okay? So basically here, your eye sees nothing. You only see things that enter your eye. For these other sources, you see, because you can look at them, right? You don't want to look directly at the laser, it's too intense. You don't want to look at the sun, it's too intense. But like the light, you can look up at those lights, and there you're directly having a source right into your eye. But it's just not that bright, so you're okay. So the second type we care about in geometrical optics is illuminated objects. And this is basically anything in the room that has light on it. Me, you, computer, chalk, whatever. Okay, so here I'm just going to use what the book used and draw a tree. A very kindergarten kind of tree. There we go. Right, trees like that. Now, it has to be illuminated by something. This one will say the sun is shining on it. Right, so sun, light is coming from the sun. And then every little point on the tree is uh, scattering light in every direction. All right, so this point on the tree, light is going all directions. I mean, it can't go into a material, but you get the idea. This point on the tree, all directions, light's going everywhere. And then when you see the tree, you're seeing uh, the light that goes into your pupil. All right, so of all these rays, a few of them go into your eye, and those are the ones you're seeing. And of all these rays, a few of them go into your eye and those are the ones you see, right? So each point sends rays in all directions. All directions, and that's how we see it, all right? So yeah, we have to get your eye involved to understand geometrical optics, unfortunately, okay? Um, one interesting aspect of this to think about is where's all that other light going, right? Well, you know, like we're all looking at this tank in this point, and it's scattering enough light. Some's going into my pupil, and some's going into your pupil, and your pupil, and your pupil times two, because we have two pupils, right? So there's a lot more light coming off this than you see. If you think about the size of your pupil, it's not really gathering much light, is it? So, you know, the actual light in the room is like blinding. Fortunately, we're just seeing this teeny little little bit of light. So keep in mind that when you see something, don't be so, you know, everything's about me. There's light going everywhere. It's not just going into your pupil, okay? Hey, the laser just went in my face. Okay, let me turn it off. All right. 
Another thing is now let's think about, so we thought about what makes, you know, where does light come from? How do we see it? Let's think about uh, the nature of the surface and realize something important is that the surface matters. Surface structure matters for light interactions. Okay, it'll be obvious what I mean when we start drawing here. Surface structure matters. So let's say we have a smooth surface. Smooth, in quotes, right, on the scale of the wavelength. So nothing is perfectly smooth. Even graphene isn't perfectly smooth, I'm sorry. Okay, it has atomic roughness, right? But uh, if it's smooth on the scale of the wavelength, which is pretty big, hundreds of nanometers, so many, many, many atoms, not that hard to make something that smooth, you would get something like this for the reflection. The light would come in, right? And the way we define the angle it comes in is from the normal, right? So here is, say, a mirror, and it comes in at theta, we're going to call it incident, theta i. So this is the incident light going like that. Well, you know what's going to happen. I don't know, we're down to like elementary school here. This is going to reflect back up at the same angle. I don't know when you learn this. At theta r. So it's going to hit the mirror and bounce off, and it's going to remain a ray. OK, so this going in is still a single ray going out. And we know the deal is that theta i equals theta r. That is one of our laws of geometrical optics. There's only two. We do all of geometrical optics with two laws. There's one of them, or two mathematical laws. Okay? So this is the law of reflection. Law of reflection. It is simply that the theta incident equals the theta reflected, and we always define the angle to the normal, never to the surface. It would also be true. Test your geometrical prowess. Are these two angles equal? Yes, because they're the difference of these from 90. So they're also equal. But we define incident and reflected based on the normal, not on the surface. Uh, so we can contrast this with a rough surface, one that is not smooth on the scale of the wavelength. And what you get here, oh, oh, there we go. There we go like that. Comes in. You say, oh, I'm going to define the normal. This is the incident coming in. I'm going to call this theta i. I'm all set up precisely. And what's going to happen? His light's going to go all over the place. It won't go into the material necessarily, but then the light goes in all directions. You could kill, still call it a reflection in all directions. Still a reflection, but not it's not really still a ray. You could say, well, it's a billion rays in all directions, and it's OK. But it's not the kind of ray that we want. So when we do this, when we look at illuminated objects, they do that because they're just rough objects. Right? Most objects are not super smooth and shiny and everything. If they are, they look like a mirror. And you don't see the object. You see a reflection of something in the object, which we're going to do in a minute. Right? OK, so we're just getting warmed up here. Light's a ray. You know how light sources work. Now let's see, let's use this just to do a little bit of geometrical optics, just a teeny bit. Is this bare? Let's see. Oh, oh. A little bit of optics here. Uh, let's see. Oh, dear. Um, let's look at our simplest. We're already ready. To look at an imaging system. That's all we need to get started. We're going to do more complicated imaging systems in the future, of course. But let's imagine here you are, you're a disembodied eye like this. We're playing D&D. You're being attacked by a disembodied eye. Let's see. OK, and here the disembodied eye is looking at a mirror like this. So this is a plain mirror. Oh, this Whiteboard got really dirty. Plain mirror. Okay? And all that means is it reflects light really well and it's smooth. So it'll reflect rays following the law of reflection. Um, if you, plain means it's a plain surface, not that it's ordinary. You can also go into Amazon and you can order a plain mirror. Okay? But we are talking about the flat kind. 
What we want to do is say this disembodied eye wants to look at this cone. Yes, I'm very creative. Okay. And the disembodied wants to see the cone. So what does the cone do? The cone, every piece, every point on the cone is scattering light in every direction. So some of it goes straight into the eye. Because the eye doesn't need a mirror to see the cone, right? It's just like, oh, there you go. I can see the cone. And you're like, no, 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 no. We, we want to do this with a mirror because we're teaching physics here. Disembodied eye says, well, roll for save. Okay. So what other rays are going to make it into the eye? Ones that bounce kind of like this, right? And then maybe ones that fill the pupil. You know, we can, you know, we talk about ray bundles all the time. Oops. Ray bundles. So I usually draw a few just to make it look like a bundle. Okay. And I chose that because that's the path that obeys the law of reflection, depending on my artistic abilities here. So there's the normal, and there is theta incident and theta r. Okay, so this path obeys theta i equals theta r, right here, right? So the eye sees it two different ways, okay? It sees light coming directly off the pyramid and then light bouncing off the mirror off the pyramid. So one thing to think is, how did the pyramid know to send the light right there and then go into the eye? How did it know? It didn't. This is sending light in every possible direction. La 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 la, up, down, left, right. There is a ray going like this. And this ray also obeys the law of reflection. But it doesn't go in the eye, so we don't care. There's, maybe there's another eye up here. Remember, we all have our eyes looking at the light coming from an object. It can go all directions. We're just going to draw the one that matters here, the one that's getting to the eye, and obeys the law of reflection. Okay. So the next question is, in an optics analysis, is how many pyramids does the eye see? All right. It sees, oh, here's all the questions. I have a stupid watch on. That's what was wrong. Um, the eye sees two, right? It sees one down here. That's the actual object. And it sees one in the mirror, but the eye, your eye is not your brain. Oh, well, let's see, shit, let's see. Your brain knows there's a mirror there, whatever. Your eye just shows you something. Your eye doesn't know there's a mirror there. So your eye says, there's an object here. We call that a virtual, ob a virtual image, okay? This is what your eye thinks happens. So we have a virtual image here. Right, so geometrical optics depends a little bit on putting the observer in the equation. Right, it's a little bit about what we see. It's not just physics that would exist even if we weren't here. Okay, I'm sorry, I was missing all these messages because it wasn't telling me. Let's see. Oh, that was a long time ago. Uh, way long. I don't know. How do you know this incident angle? How do you know which is incident, which is reflected? That's a good question. So, law. I mean, they were all good, but they're all too late. Um, Incident reflected just depends on which way it's going. Okay, so incident is when you're approaching the surface and reflected is after. So we have to put arrows really to know for sure. Okay, a lot of times geometrical optics is reversible, meaning it would be the same geometry if it was going this way or going that way. So in some sense, it's interchangeable incident and reflected. But in most problems, you say this is the source, it's going this way, that's incident, this is the reflected ray, that's going that way. So it's based on the direction it's going. Okay, so the, just the notation that I want to tell you about, and it's really we're just warming up on using it, is that um, we call this the object distance. The distance S equals object distance, and it's from the object to the mirror. Now it's telling me, right? So that's uh, this, S, right? But what we know from this imaging system is that there's also the virtual uh, object distance, or the, I'm sorry, the image distance. Right, this is where the object is, this is where the image is. Even though it's virtual, it has a distance to the mirror. It doesn't really exist, right? But we can define it with geometry, because ray optics is geometrical optics, okay? This is like the dog that thinks there's the other dog behind the mirror and he runs back there and there's nothing and he runs back. That's because the dog doesn't understand geometrical optics. If we did geometry here, you could even prove that these are the same, right? So here's a triangle. Uh-oh. Let's see. This is theta i because those are two parallel lines, and this is a, a bisector or something. And uh, therefore, that is the same as that. And since this is straight, that's the same angle, and it's the same height, so it's the same distance. 
Okay, so a lot of these geometrical things will just tell you. Sometimes on a homework, you're going to have to do them, though. Could you convince yourself that this is the same distance as this? Think about that. That's about the level of geometry you would have to do. Now, the key is that this is a straight line. Right. A little bit of geometry. We forgot to put it on the prereqs. I think it's a prereq to get in. I don't know. Okay, so that was uh, reflection and imaging with reflection. So next we'll do refraction after that. We'll do the break here. I lost track of time. Okay, so now we got to keep going. we got to do refraction. Remember I said there were two laws in geometrical optics. One is the law of reflection. Two is uh, refraction, the law of refraction. Once both laws are done, then we're done. So light rays change direction. Change direction when they enter a dielectric. I have my milky fish tank here. Maybe you'll be able to see it. Uh, let's see. So this demo, if it doesn't go well, I drink the milky fish tank as a punishment for myself. No, I don't. Of course not. I would never do something weird. Okay? So what you're going to be able to see is because of that. Because the fish tank is milky, uh, you'll be able to see the beam going into it. Like, look at it. Ooh, beam. Off. It's optics. We're doing optics now, so you gotta like control the lights. All right, so you can see the laser being in um, the uh, milky fish tank. So when it's not, when it goes, so the dielectric interface we're going to look at is the laser going into the fish tank. And then you can, hopefully, you can maybe tell that it's changing its angle right when it enters. See, see, see that? Whoa, it changes its angle. Anybody <laughs> <laughs> Brazilian blow up? Um, so we're going to describe that mathematically. Because that happens at the interface of any two, uh, any dielectric interface. This is a hair thing. Uh, let's see. So now, how do we describe it mathematically? Ah, oh, well. We should use the same as law. Let's set it up op optically first. This is what you saw. You had uh, n equals 1 here. You had n equals, let's say, 1.5. I don't say 1.5. You really had water. So you have 1.33. You have water with milk in it, so who knows. Okay. And the light comes in like this. And we have a surface normal, just like before. Right? We have theta incident, just like before. But what happens is the light bends. And you saw it kind of like bent down. So when you go into a higher index, it bends towards the normal. Theta, refraction, and reflection um, have the same first letter. That's why I probably don't use I and R. We use one and two. All right. One and two. So theta one is the angle to the normal in index one. Theta two is the angle to the normal in index two. That's the way to set it up correctly. Now the law. It describes this is called Snell's Law after Snellius von Willenbrandt. Okay? It was actually first discovered centuries before by Ivan Halsem. Ivan Halsem, I apologize. I tried. Okay, but in our Eurocentric view of science, we give all the credit to Snellius von Willenberg because his was written in German and not in harder languages for us to read. The people that wrote the history books. So Snell's Law is simply, it's very easy. It's just in one times sine theta 1 equals n2 times sine theta 2. Well, that's it. Why? Electromagnetic theory, matching boundary conditions, great fun, hours and hours of lecture, can prove that this will happen. Of course, Snell figured out experimentally uh, that it happens and figured out these angles. Okay? That's it. We're done with geometrical optics. Two laws. Reflection, theta 1 equals theta 2. Fraction, n sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. And it works in either direction, just like reflection. You can go n1 to n2, or you can go n2 to n1. And basically, as the light propagates around, this angle times, or the sign of that angle times n is just sort of constant. So you can send it through multiple layers. 
figure out what it's going to do. So the one way to get a little bit intuitive about it is to imagine that light, we got to do a little bit of that, uh, you know, anthropomorphization of light. We're going to say, oh, well, let's imagine it has feelings. And when you go into a higher index, how would you feel if you were light walking along and suddenly you went to, into a higher index? You'd go, oh. All right? It falls to the normal. If you go into a higher index, you fall to the normal. You become uh, like this. Right? Here's why it's at a high angle. Oh, look at me, look at me. And then it falls. Oh, no. It's all to the normal. Um, into a smaller index, or a lower index, it be a smaller index, you spring from the normal. Then you're excited. Oh, the index got lower. Let me stretch out my wavelength away from the normal. And all we have to do is look at the same diagram backwards. This is now the instant. I'm going to go to a lower index. Ah, yes, spring from the normal. Or you can use the math. It depends on what kind of person you are. There's no judgment. You can be either kind of person. You can use the math or use the feelings. Um, let's see. So now we're going to do a couple of uh, examples of the kind of calculations you can do uh, when you uh, send the light to something. So let's have uh, rays, I won't say a lot, let's say rays through a dielectric slab. All the interesting stuff is over, we're back to slabs. Okay. So say uh, we have a ray going through you know, a piece of glass or something, we can see it on the wall. If you turn the glass, the, the beam will shift. So let's think about how much it shifts. Let's see, ray enters the dielectric slab. Ray through a dielectric slab enters at theta of one, exits at, and that's the question, what angle does the light come out at if it goes in at theta one? Okay, so we have two interfaces to think about. Okay, so we set it up like this. There's the normal. Where is, think for yourself, if you can identify where theta one is, here is n one equals one, here is n two. 1.5, say glass, n3, well, we can call it n1 again, n1 equals 1. We're going from air to glass to air. Where is theta 1? That's the angle of incidence in the first medium. Oh, there's theta 1. And if you use feelings, you can draw it the next step without this equation yet. Oh, it's going to fall to the normal, like that. So you have a new uh, angle. Say, wait, which side do I draw the angle on for theta 2? Well, it's got to be inside the material, inside the index. So there is theta 2. And now what's going to happen when you get back into angle 1? Well, that's going to run from the normal again. So the question is, what angle is that? It doesn't have to be, like, let's just call it n3, just to be clear. We're solving for n3. All right, we know n3 is 1. We're asking, what is the angle going to end up being? So I just want to show you how to use Mill's law. Okay? So first you apply it this inter interface. So we'll call this A and B. Apply Snell at A. Okay. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. So we're basically just trying to solve for sine theta 2. Okay. Well, sine theta 2 equals what? N1 over N2 sine theta 1. And you say, well, what is n1 over n2? In this case, uh, that's going to be less than 1. Right? 1 over 1.5. I'm going to do a higher index. n2 is higher than n1. So this is going to be less than 1. Which means this angle sine is going to be less than this angle sine. Which means this angle is going to be less than this angle. So check. It matches our feelings. Right? Theta 2 is small. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing all these problems, I mean, this might help you, probably won't, but it might. If we look at theta from zero, everything's going to be from zero to 90 degrees. Right? If something doesn't, like, you can't have this angle bigger than 90, otherwise it's not really in this medium. So let's plot sine from zero to 90 degrees. There it is. It's monotonic. They increase together. So if the sine is smaller, the angle's smaller. So I'm just saying, if you get that the sine is smaller, but you can't get that the angle is smaller here, 
Remember, they go together. They're just sine theta. So you can think of the sine theta as just the angle of these problems. It's not mathematically equal, but since they increase together and go to zero together, it's not they go together. OK, so you might look at that and say, well, now I probably have to do some horrible inverse sine to get theta 2. But you actually don't. We could say theta 2 is the inverse sine of n1 over n2 something to 1. We don't have to do that. Let's just hold on to this for a minute. And now let's apply Snell and B. Right? And you'll see, like I just said, you don't have to always go to theta. You can just think in terms of sine theta. Apply Snell and B. Okay. Well, now n2 sine theta 2 equals. Uh, n3, which is really equal to n1, sine theta 3. Right. This looks scary. Why did I do this? I could have called it n3 is equal to n1. We just substituted it. We could say n3. Let's say n1 equals n3. Call it n1. All we did there, we didn't break Snell's law. We saw this for a specific case. So now let's just plug sine theta 2 in here to get sine theta 3. All right, sine theta 2. N2, sine theta 2 is N1 over N2, uh, sine theta 1, all right, equals N1, sine theta 3. Uh, the N2s cancel, the N1s cancel, and sine theta 1 equals sine theta 3. Which means what? Theta 1 equals theta 3. So the angle that went in equals the angle that it came out. We just proved that with Snell's law. That's an example of a geometrical optics problem. That's what you're doing. Okay? Let's make it more fun. Oh. Uh, let's see. So, an example of homework problem. Here's examples of things you could do. Maybe I'll get you started. How big and how far does it shift? As you look at this, you say, okay, it came out at the same angle, but look, it kind of moved over a little bit. Let me draw it again, right? It came in like this, and it might, you know, it would have just gone like this if the glass weren't there. This is like the no glass path here, but it fell towards the normal, and then it came back out at the same angle. So you can see it shifted. Shift due to glass. Uh -huh. So you got to figure out, like an example question would be, how far down does it shift? How far does it shift? Like 30 years. So how far does it shift? So you'd have to think, well, how am I going to figure that out with geometry? What am I going to do? This is where the geometry knowledge comes in in practice. Anytime you got to figure out something with geometry, uh, you probably want to draw right triangles. Uh, you probably want to draw lines, draw lines normal to things. I would draw a line like this, and then say, boom, I see two right triangles. Right? It's like, I could just, how many right triangles do you see? Uh, well, there's one here. Da, 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 there. Whoops. There. There's one. And then there's one here. And do we know any of the angles of those right triangles? We do. So for this triangle, this angle here is what? That's theta 2, right there, because this line I drew is really just the normal. Look at that. So I basically just extended the normal and drew it solid across the slip. You could have some thickness t that we know. And then I say, OK, now I have a very right triangle. Now I am, uh, as my grandma would say, I am shitting in tall cotton. Okay, that's, that was her phrase. And uh, you would say, I need this. I know t, and I know theta 2. So I have the adjacent, and I want the opposite. I say tangent theta 2 is the opposite, which is like the distance it shifted over the adjacent, which is t. Is that problem? So you get a problem. You might be given t. You might be given the ends, n1 and n2. So you could actually calculate how far down that one shifted. Now, we need higher level geometry skills. Let's do the ray that would have happened. Would have been so. 
How are we gonna get that angle? From things we know. Well, remember, two lines that cross have the same angle across them. Is that, is that how the law goes? Something like that. Right, so we have a normal line here, we have a ray here, therefore that angle equals this angle, and oh my god, that's an angle we know. That's theta one. So for this triangle, right, you know it's the same thing. You know that the tangent of theta one equals uh, the d you want, so this would be d1, this would be d2, this d2, again over t. So now you have d1 and d2. You know how far down the refractive ray went, you know how far down the ray would have gone, were it not for the, uh, for, uh, the class. And the difference is just the answer. But you might not be told theta 2. How are you going to get theta 2? Snell's law. So all you'd be given is the thickness and theta 1 in the two indexes, air and glass. How would you solve it? You have these two equations, Snell's law gets this theta 2 in terms of theta 1, and then it's an ugly mess of inverse tangents. And when you're doing these and you say, you know, after said, if you ever get into a weird equation with inverse stuff in it, then you probably screwed it up. That doesn't apply to geometric law. Okay. You will get into weird things with uh, inverse tangents and messed up stuff. So d1 and d2 were too small to draw because of my four artsmanship. Okay, here is D1. D1 is how far down the grade one, or how far down the first one would go. That's a poor choice. Okay. And then two was here. How far down the second one would go. That's here. So that's giving you an idea of the level of geometry you need to be able to do, do these problems. Okay. Okay, now we're going to do another Yeah, we want to put it over there. We want to image mute. There we go. Okay. Answer a few questions here. Oh dear. Shift is a physical shift, not a phase shift, right? Yes, physical shift. There are no phases and no amplitudes. Have I said phase the whole lecture? No. Now I just did twice. What is significance of D2? So D2 is just how far down it shifts with or without the glass. Over the one ray but with no refraction, as though the glass weren't there. We were saying, how much of a shift does the glass cause? Doesn't it just drop D1? Yeah, I didn't. I, in a problem, I would have stated the question, question more clearly. How much does it shift when you put the glass in? That's the question. Okay. Uh, now we're going to solve this famous dark. Oh, where did it go? Let's see. So we have the dark ray and the light ray. How are we going to get the dark ray and the light ray? I turned off the wrong one. I'm an idiot. Let's see. Please down. We're going to solve this. This is the most famous case of refraction in the world. Right? Does this look even vaguely familiar to anyone? No? Well, you're going to enjoy it anyway. Dream, or is it real? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> it's really going. Okay, here we go. We're really going to calculate it. Cover 
let's look at it. So here is this. So geometry. Do you know the angles of our equilateral triangle? Do you know the corner angles? You're going to need to. You may have to use Google to do your homework in this problem, or in all these problems. It's 60 degrees. Okay. So first we're going to look at, did they get this angle correct right here? Okay, so let's look. Let's say that this one is flat, right? They have white light spreading out, I don't know why. Well, let's just say this one is flat. Did they get this incident angle correct? Let's find out. Okay, so here we go. We have one flat like that. I think one should be quiet. Okay, so it's flat like that. But to do snails, all you have to have the normal. How are you going to get the normal? I don't. Uh, well, the normal I can draw like that. But now I need to know the angle of theta two in the material. You're going to have to do geometry to get it. Okay? You're going to have to figure out that that's 30 degrees. How do I know that's 30 degrees? Well, I know that the normal is 90 degrees from this surface. That's 60. If I draw a flat line parallel to this line, this is also 60. Therefore, the complementary or supplementary, whatever it is, I don't know words, is 30. All right? So that means that this thing went, uh, uh, bent, uh, that it's, uh, theta 2 is 30. The question is, what is theta 1 if theta 2 is 30? Right? So we say this is n equals 1, this is n equals 1.5. Right? So 1 times sine of theta 1. That's what we're trying to figure out, if they get it right, equals 1.5 times sine theta 2. That's all it is. So it's the inverse sine of uh, 1.5. Uh, no, that breaks it down. You get theta 1 equals 48.6 degrees. Okay. So is that correct? We are going to draw a ray on 48.6 degrees. There's the normal. Whoa, pretty close, right? Within a few degrees, they got it right. Do you really believe that these guys could do the diffraction? <laughs> Probably not. But you know who really did it? Yes, I could believe that. Right? That's a famous graphic designer that drew the album cover. I'm thinking this guy probably has Snell's Law somewhere written down in these books. <laughs> so I think he probably make it totally accurate. But that's not the interesting part of the album cover, right? The interesting part, obviously, is the rainbow. We can also ask that they get the rainbow correct. Let's see. Oh, we've got plenty of time to do problems. Okay, the rainbow. Rainbow. Why is it because I've been lying to you in glass depends on wavelength. A little bit. Okay. So in the index in the blue is about 1.53 really. And the index of the red is 1.52. So the angles will actually come out slightly different. Right. So now we can draw this side. Same white light is going through. The index of the normal is there, 30 degrees. Do your geometry again. 60 plus 30 is 90. Right? And then they're all going to come out like this. But they're going to come out at different angles. Let's do Snell's Law. Here we go. Let's look at the blue. Okay, for the blue, uh, sine of 30 degrees times 1.53. In here, we have 1.53 for the blue times the sine of 30 equals air times the sine of theta blue. How, how much it comes out. If you do that, you get 49.9 degrees. Okay. What do we do for the red? Red. All right, 1.52 uh, times the sine of 30 equals 1 times the sine of theta red. Theta red equals 49.4 degrees. And look, they have theta red at a smaller angle than theta blue. 
Do they have it by a half a degree? Uh, close. I think it's a little bit more than a half degree difference between theta blue and theta red. Right? But it's pretty close. What did they get wrong? Oh, we have here a commercial. What did they get wrong? What's going on in here? Why is it white inside? It wouldn't be white. It would start to refract and change colors here. They drew a change in colors like it went, suddenly went just from white to color. Right? Really, it would start, the colors would start to separate here. And also, this angle's way too big. It wouldn't really spread out that much. It would stay, you know, adjusting by just a teeny range of a half degree here and just a half degree here. But you wanted to be able to see the rainbow. Although you could argue, why is that white? Oh, wait a minute, what's the wavelength inside the glass? It's really short. Dude, so maybe we just figured out the secret behind the dark side of the moon. Okay, that's two examples then of the kind of geometry you're going to have to do. All right? Good luck with your geometry memories.